we are going to talk about fret etiquette, fretting etiquette for the modern banjo player. I'm gonna show you tips, tricks, and tools that you can use that will instantly change your relationship with this part of the instrument today on Banjo Quest. Just a few housekeeping things before we get started on fret etiquette. The first is I haven't been doing a lot of public YouTube videos, but I have still been doing exclusive content for my Banjo Quest community over on Patreon. Most of my time outside of lessons and practice is going directly into that community. I'm creating rich content that stands the test of time, including videos and tablature, all for patrons. If you want access to that and you want to support a real live independent musician who does this for a living, that's me, hop on over to Patreon and join the Banjo Quest community. Another way to support me is to buy t-shirts. The link is below. And the last thing is if you just want to support me for free, you don't have to do anything other than click a button, click the subscribe button below. I recently looked at my Google Analytics and I found out Surprisingly, this really surprised me, that only 25% of my viewers are subscribed, 25%. So 75% of you folks, I'm working hard here. I'm working hard. These videos take a lot of time. Please, if you would, if you value an independent voice in acoustic music, hit the subscribe button. All right, that's enough of that. Let's get started on Fretiquette. Let's have some fun today. All right, before I start showing you some stuff and throw some tab on the screen and work through some exercises with you, I do wanna mention one really important thing, and that is this is a huge family of concepts. There is no way I can cover it all today. I'm just gonna to touch on three basic areas of thought that I have when it comes to fretting the five-string banjo. So with that out of the way, let's dive in. We're gonna go through this step by step. I have three major families of thoughts about how to interact with the banjo with your fretting hand. Let's get started. All right, the number one thing to think about when you're working with fretiquette is your arch. How you're getting over the fretboard, getting the fingers over to fire directly into the fretboard. I think that's hugely important and here is why. If you have a really shallow grip or approach, fretting approach to the frets and neck, you don't have a lot of mechanical advantage over those strings. You're gonna be kind of pinching the neck. I say to my students, stop the pinchy pinchy. They get like this and they're really flat to the neck and the frets. We wanna be arched up and over. This provides a very steep angle where you are charging into the frets straight on. I like to think like an athlete when I'm playing the instrument. I really think of this as a sport, except we're training really small muscles instead of the big muscles. And mechanical advantage is hugely important when it comes to fretting. So get the arch up over the frets and drive straight in and out of those frets and strings. The other thing about the arch is I've got air between me and the instrument. So my palm is not collapsed up and in and supporting this low line of the neck. I'm arched and out over the fretboard and I've got space between my palm and this outside line of the neck. What I see a lot is when people are fretting, they migrate, migrate, migrate back so that their palm is facing their audience. This is a big no-no because not only do you lose your mechanical advantage over the neck, but you kind of paralyze your limberness of your fingers and tendons, and it's really hard to get any work done. This is something I see, it's so common, don't do this. When you see this, when you see your palm pointing that way, look at it, check in with Fretiquette. You know you got your manners to keep track of. You open up, down, and look straight into your palm from your playing position. The other thing you probably noticed is when I do this, the whole, apparatus raises up from the floor and this is all just tension, needless tension in my playing. I don't want tension, I wanna be loose and soft. So I drop, open, pivot around the neck, fire straight in and maintain my arch over the frets. Now there's lots of talk about grip, which grip, fiddle grip, classical guitar grip. I use them all for different purposes. Right now, I'm super psyched about a hybrid grip that I've discovered, and that is I get the banjo neck right there off of that big joint of my thumb, just over a little bit on the bone of the first bone of my thumb part, 
and I kind of lock in there. Lock is probably too strong a word, but the banjo neck just wants to click right in there. And then I've got this really hard surface to push against, which is nice because again, with mechanical advantage, if my thumb is super stable, when I fret, there's not a sponginess or give, it's just very easy and efficient. Classical guitar grip puts the banjo neck on the ball of the thumb. Fine, good for playing up the neck because you're really arched over. You can get all four fingers down on the board. That's a smart play. Fiddle grip, where you're sort of in the webbing of the hand, is super comfortable, laid back. You can kick back on your couch and it feels real easy and like you're not trying too hard. That's kind of cool too. It's really, really comfortable. Just always working on the arch and the air between your palm. If you can maintain arch and have air and support the fretting hand with the thumb, the thumb goes with you no matter where you go, those things, if those things are in place, then any grip can work as long as the tension isn't flowing up the arm and you're all jacked up and weird up here, upstream. That's the arch. Let's move on to the next aspect of fretiquette. The second big umbrella concept that I urge all banjo players and anybody who's working with a fretted instrument to think about and really focus on and try to enact in their own playing is touch. This is really easily overlooked and I have a secret to unlocking light touch right now. I can tell you how to do it and you will instantly unlock a lighter touch on the instrument. Let me show you what I mean. My arm is dropped, I'm hinging at the elbow, boom, I'm right into my fretting position. I'm locked into my very favorite fretting position, this hybrid where I'm riding that thumb bone. I'm arched up, my fingers are driving into the strings and fret straight on. Now, I'm probably got a death grip because that's what 90% of the people I teach have, white knuckle in it through any passage. You guys know and you guys have probably experienced this horrible feeling that your slide sounds super draggy and you're hearing the middle note. That all has to do with too much pressure on this fretboard. There doesn't need to be a whole lot of pressure. Light fingers, light touch, easy. Fret close to the frets, get right up to them without touching the frets so you're not bending or pushing the string into the trough between frets. Get nice up and close and stay light and relaxed. Here's a way to instantly turn on your relaxation. You're not gonna believe me when I tell you this, but I want you to try it in your own playing. Take a passage of a tune you're working on, play it, and then play it 30% quieter with your striking hand. And I promise you, when you subtract that volume, just 30% of your volume, if you take that away, you will instantly lighten up with your left hand. And this is because for most banjo players, right and left hand independence isn't a thing. What the right hand does, or the striking hand if you're a lefty, what the striking hand does, the, the fretting hand will do as well. So if you're crushing it with your striking hand, your fretting hand is going to press too hard. It's a one for one, I see it all the time. So in a lesson, when I see somebody gripping the neck to death, I say, take 30% of your volume away from your striking hand and instantly, like a cloud of smoke, tension gets released on the fretting hand. And once you get the feeling of what it's like to fret, lightly, quietly, and softly, it becomes easier to sort of enact without using my little 30% volume trick. Give it a try. I think you will be really surprised at the impact it has on your fretting hand. So let's talk about the third concept, probably why you're still here, what you've been waiting for. This is a question I get all the time. How do I know which finger to use when on my fretting hand? There's good news and bad news. I'm gonna share that with you now. First of all, I think of this within fretiquette as the grammar of the fretting hand or strategy, just basic fretting strategy with the fretting hand. The good news is I can show you a couple of quick, easy rules that will make this so much easier for you. The second, the bad news, the bad news, the other side of the coin is there is no one right way to do this. So these rules are inherently soft. And that's a good thing. 
because if we had to adhere to a very rigid set of fretting rules, certain passages would become difficult, other passages would become impossible. We have to be able to be flexible with that fretting hand. And that's where we go back to the arch and the softness of touch. If you have those two first principles in mind when you're approaching your fretting technique, this section, the grammar of fretting, becomes so much easier. So if you don't have those first two elements, go back, pause this video, it will be here. Pause this video, fix that stuff, and then come back to the grammar section. All right, so I am in G. Standard G, that's where we're gonna start. I'll cover other tunings over on Patreon, but let me introduce some basic concepts in G standard. The first concept I wanna to introduce to you is the natural fret. So in G standard, in first position, we can just start off with our grammar thinking about how each finger corresponds to its natural fret. So my index corresponds to fret one, middle corresponds to fret two, ring to fret three, and little finger to fret four. So we have a chromatic run. Natural fret correspondence. Now, here's where the rules get real soft. I can name a easy example right off the top, and that is our C chord in standard G. As soon as we go into our C chord, you know that we have to break or bend that natural fret rule. So if I'm running some phrases, I want to more or less stick to this natural fret rule, but it breaks down really quickly and the C chord is the first place it breaks down. Because suddenly I've got my second finger on the second fret and my third finger on the third fret. So here's a nice little rule. Although we like to basically fall back on this natural fret concept, chords will often disrupt this rule. So the way to think about this, the way I think about this, is context dictates fretting grammar. We've got this chord, this is our context. It requires bending of our rules. The rules are soft. Let's look at another example of this. So I'm going to throw some tab up on the screen and we've got something kind of complicated here. We've got a downstroke on the second fret, drop thumb on one and two, and then we've got a fourth fret note on the fourth fret third string. So all together, this might be played, if I'm going to play to the natural fret, with my middle finger and my little finger on frets two and four respectively on the third string. But if I show you the context of where we're going and where we're coming from with this passage, we're going to let those soft rules work for us and we're going to change the way we fret. We're going to change our grammar and our strategy on how we negotiate this. So I reveal the preceding measure and the measures that follow and suddenly the thing that fe felt really cut and dry is now wildly different. This is how I would fret this passage now. So I used my middle finger, middle, middle, ring, middle, ring. So I'm breaking a whole lot of our natural fretting rules because context dictates it. How do you know when to break the rules? Well, when things are uncomfortable and difficult to play. And you may not know that until you introduce some speed. So speed is our friend. We're always using speed to teach us efficient, soft ways to play the instrument. We're also using it to teach us efficiency for fretting. So I'm gonna introduce my friend speed. Let me play this passage up to speed. I can't play that passage that fast, the way, the way I just played it if I'm using my little finger because I run out of runway, suddenly that next measure, measure M, B 
becomes extremely difficult if I've already got my little finger engaged. Getting over to frets five and four on the first string are almost impossible at speed when I'm using my little and ring fingers and sort of maxing out my runway before I even get to M. So instead, I've chosen to break first position and carry the middle with me and use it throughout the first two measures before we get to measure M because speed is showing me that I can't play that fast unless I make some serious changes to my strategy. Now, this is not saying that everything goes because there are good strategies and there are bad strategies when it comes to fretiquette. So it takes a while to kind of learn the grammar, learn the language and get comfortable, but the first step to me is to even know that fretiquette is a thing. <laughs> so when I'm introducing this concept to students, instead of sort of showering them with rules, in this situation do that, in this situation do that, this situation do that, I let them think, first of all, strategic thinking on the fretboard is super important. Don't take it for granted. A lot of people don't even think about it. And often, passages that seem impossible to play crack wide open when you get the fretiquette portion of the passage correct. So I would encourage you, if you've got tunes that are difficult, if you've got passages and phrases that are getting you stumped, take some time, think your way through it, be soft, be light with your arch, try different things and set that up against speed to test your hypotheses when it comes to fretiquette. One last thing I'll say about the grammar piece. The arch and the touch, that goes with every tuning on the banjo, but grammar changes tuning to tuning. So you will have to readjust, recalibrate your fretting strategies for every single tuning that you learn. It's not bad because these concepts are soft. And once you start getting it in your head that fretting strategy is hugely important to both your ability to play well, but also the phrasing and the sound that you create with the instrument, you'll learn quickly your individual rules. And that's the last thing I'll leave you with. I could sit down with 10 really great banjo players and we would all probably, maybe, depending on the passage, come up with different ways to fret around a single phrase, if the phrase is complicated enough. So that just, again, reinforces this idea that these rules are soft. So don't ask your instructor how to fret every passage on your page. Figure it out, come up with several strategies, try them, find the one that works best, and then move on to the next. You will learn your own dialect when it comes to fretting grammar if you spend the time to think about your strategy. All right, that does it for me today. If you want more information about fretiquette, if you want to make beautiful sounds on the banjo, head on over to Patreon. The link is in the description below, and I will see you next time on Banjo Quest. <laughs>